Bom dia. E, a verdade é que estávamos tendo tan bom tempo, my, my Parker Pearson é, é, mais, é mais eu aqui, que casi que estávamos pensando em deixar, a, em deixar a conferência igual para outro dia ou, ou outro ano. É, bem, a verdade é que seria um pouco vanidoso pela minha parte ponerme a, a falar ou fazer uma introdução sobre, sobre Stonehenge. É um sítio que fala, que fala por si mesmo, é uma referência já secular da, da arqueologia europeia. É um, é um lugar onde algumas das figuras mais famosas da arqueologia britânica pois, tenham intervido, ou, ou escavado, ou publicado eh, algum dos múltiples aspectos que afectan a este sitio e, a, e, o, e o seu contorno e tan é assim que de feito lhe perguntava a Parker Pearson antes se, como é que se decidirá involucrar-se em, em Stonehenge tendo em conta pois, que é um sítio que está já impregnado de uma, de uma fortíssima tradição eh, investigadora né? enfim eh, Mike Parker Pearson é uma pessoa extraordinariamente conhecida, leva mais de uma década trabalhando neste lugar, mas previamente tem um currículo investigador não só em Inglaterra, e não só sobre o Neolítico, mas sobre a Idade do Bronze, sobre a Idade do Ferro, e tem feito também campanha de escavação pues, praticamente em medio, em, em medio mundo. E, já digo, creo que não é nada que eu possa dizer vai engadir eh, a sua reputação ou ao conhecimento que vocês já, já têm sobre ele. Assim que, bueno, vamos fazer uma tradução, uma tradução simultânea, espero que a coisa saia, saia mais ou menos eh, regular e, e, que, e que, de todas maneiras, ainda que eu o faga mal, coisa que sempre, sempre é possível, eh, o sitio, como eu digo, fala por si mesmo. Então, eh, incluso ainda que eu faga mal eh, com a minha tradução, sem dúvida, vocês pues, vão, vão ter acesso a, a pelo menos, as grandes ideias, as, as, a maior parte das coisas que Mike vai comentar eh, agora. Eh, Obrigado, Mike. Obrigado. <risos> Uh, thank, thank you for, my, for inviting me. Buenos dias. Uh, that's all the Spanish I know. <laughs> but Ramon will be translating for me. Um, I've been working at Stonehenge since 2003, so it's over 10 years, and I want to tell you a bit about the many finds we have made, and particularly those that we have made in more recent uh, years. Uh, and our project, as you will see, is still uh, continuing. We are now in a third stage, the Stones of Stonehenge, having finished with the Riverside project and then with the Feeding Stonehenge project. Feeding Stonehenge looking at the resourcing of how the community built Stonehenge. Uh, it all started because of a colleague of mine from Madagascar, uh, Ramil Sonina, who I have worked with throughout the 1990s uh, when he came to Britain in 1998 and he, uh, he's not only a specialist in megalith uh, building but his family actually has a tradition of building megaliths as well. So I thought he must come and see Stonehenge to tell me what he thinks. And we got there and he said, Mike, what do you mean you don't know what it is for? Have you learned nothing from working with me for 10 years? And I had to admit I did not know. So he, uh, he explained to me very simply that because it is built of stone, it is built for eternity. And the eternal is the world of the ancestors. So Stonehenge had to be a place of the ancestors. And from this, we developed a, a hypothesis that Stonehenge was just one half of a larger complex in which the other half 
was in organic materials. So in other words, perishable like human life. So out of this, we developed a, a, a map really of, of the region to suggest that Stonehenge was linked to this other place of the living by avenues that led along, that led to the River Avon. And in this, this map, you can see that basic relationship that we suggested between the domain of the ancestors and the domain of the living. And there I left it because I thought somebody else will want to investigate to find out if this theory is right or wrong. Um, but nobody seemed very, uh, many people were very excited by what we had found. Some people said that's a great idea. Some people said that's the worst idea you've ever had, Mike. And uh, uh, I, I realized that I didn't want to work at Stonehenge because it attracts some very strange people. <laughs> many of them are completely crazy, and that's just the archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, in 2003, I realized that we had to uh, get involved. And uh, marked in blue on this map are some of the 42 excavations that we have carried out in the Stonehenge area. And we will be ca carrying out another one uh, this August. So if anyone is in the UK, you are very welcome to come and visit. OK. Um, uh, o vínculo de Mike Parker Pearson con Stonehenge se remonta a algo máis dunha década, xa desenvolveu, leva desenvolvendo tres eh, proxectos sucesivos, eh, o Stonehenge Riverside eh, Project, o proxecto eh, alimentando Stonehenge e o proxecto sobre as, eh, sobre as pedras de eh, Stonehenge. Eh, comentou que realmente non tiña, non era a súa idea eh, involucrarse con Stonehenge, pero que durante cerca dunha década traballara con especialista eh, en megalitismo, megalitismo en Madagascar, eh, Ram, Rami Xilonina, <risas> ah, e que... Eh, que non só é un especialista en megalitismo nesa, na zona en Malgache, sino que, ademais, eh, está relacionado con unha familia que construían eles mesmos eh, megalitos eh, tradicionais nesa, nesa illa. Así que o levou a, a Stonehenge e eh, comentou lle Rami Silonina eh, cando, cando chega ali con, con Mike, eh, dille, bueno, pero realmente é que esto está, esto está moi claro. Stonehenge é un monumento en pedra, é un monumento, polo tanto, para a eternidade e que está eh, diseñado para os antepasados, para, eh, para os ancestros. E probablemente nesta, eh, nesta paisaxe podemos eh, facer unha división entre unha zona de arquitectura máis perecedeira, arquitectura en madeira, que está vinculada ao mundo, eh, ao mundo dos vivos, e unha arquitectura para, eh, para a eternidade que sería a de, eh, a, de Stone, eh, a de Stonehenge e outras estruturas elaboradas en pedra. Comunicados eh, estes, estes dous espacios, estas dúas, estes dous sectores comunicados pola, polo, eh, polo, río, polo río Eibon. Eh, unha especie de vía de unión entre esas dúas metades, eh, área dos vivos e área dos mortos, que se distinguen na comarca de eh, inmediata a Stonehenge. Okay. Uh, here, here is a chronological table uh, to show you our periods within British prehistory, and I have marked in red the period when Stonehenge was in use, from its initial construction uh, a thousand years after the introduction of agriculture to Britain, uh, construction around 3000 BC. Uh, it went through five stages of construction. The second stage was around 2,500, just before the beginning of a very short period of the Chalcolithic. And then it really went out of use by the time of the Middle Bronze Age. <coughs> it's one of a number of monuments from the late Neolithic that are found on the chalk uplands of southern England from the River Thames to the south coast. 
And uh, many of those you will have heard of, particularly Avebury in the north. Uh, you may not have heard of these other ones further south. But Stonehenge, as I've already mentioned, is very close to a major henge monument of Darrington Walls. And this is the largest henge in Britain. It's slightly larger than these other two at Marden and Darrington Walls. Uh, when we use the word henge uh, in, uh, in, uh, as archaeologists, we mean that it has a ditch on the inside of the bank. It is as if you're trying to keep something in rather than keep things out. Uh, unfortunately, the archaeological definition then excludes Stonehenge because Stonehenge has its ditch on the outside. But I'm afraid that is the illogical world of archaeologists, uh, and we are, we are stuck with this, this uh, slightly odd definition. But um, what are the theories about Stonehenge? And for 300 years in Britain, we have lived not only with a theory about Stonehenge being built as a temple for Druids, uh, but also by the development of a series of new religions, uh, people that, that now worship as Druids. And they're now a recognized religion in Britain. Uh, they, they haven't always seen eye to eye with archaeologists because um, the human bones that we excavated from Stonehenge, they wanted those reburied in a religious ceremony. But I'm very glad to say that finally, after seven years, the British government has agreed that the bones should be kept in a museum, and that is where they now are. Uh, this, this theory, of course, goes all the way back to William Stukeley, an antiquarian who thought that Stonehenge, uh, that, that he realized it was prehistoric. So his guide to prehistory 300 years ago was the book by Julius Caesar on the invasion of Britain and Gaul, uh, because in that he talks about Druids. So, of course, Stukeley realized that since this was prehistory, Druids had to be associated with Stonehenge. He did not know that Stonehenge was at least two and a half thousand years earlier than Julius Caesar. But, of course, it has stuck in the popular mind that Stonehenge is a place of Druids. In the 1960s and onwards, there was increasing interest in the astronomical aspects of Stonehenge. Uh, and all sorts of claims for predicting eclipses have been made for many different directions that, uh, uh, of the, the sun and the moon. Of course, when you have a circular monument, it's very easy to make claims in whatever direction you like. But the two that are most certain are the direction towards the midsummer sunrise and in the opposite direction at 180 degrees to the midwinter solstice. And we now realize that it is that latter direction towards midwinter solstice sunrise that is, sorry, sunset, midwinter solstice sunset, which is actually the more significant of the two. Now, this interest in the astronomy has led to all sorts of interesting theories about Stonehenge. And uh, today I receive emails every week from people all over the world about their own particular theories. But I won't tell you about those. I'll let Ramon, Ramon translate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Escaceráme de comentar que, eh, en principio, eh, Mike eh, eh, dixo antes que uh, él non estaba especialmente interesado en trabajar en, en Stonehenge porque eh, Stonehenge es una especie de imán que atrae todo tipo de gente bastante excéntrica. Eh, eh, no son precisamente los menos excéntricos, menos raros, los arqueólogos que pululan desde hace más de un século en, en, torno a, en torno a Stonehenge. De hecho, el monumento Stonehenge tiene una, tiene una historia relativamente compleja que habrán que desde el neolítico final hasta los finales del bronce antiguo, en términos cronológicos de cronología absoluta, está bastante bien establecido entre con tres grandes fases, entre 3.000 o 2.500 antes de Cristo, una breve fase calcolítica entre 2.500 o 2.200, e una, eh, última, un último periodo no eh, bronce antiguo entre 2.200 y e eh, 1.600. Eh, 
eh, Stonehenge eh, da, serviu para bautizar un tipo de monumentos na prehistoria recente británica que son os Henge. Os Henge eh, se caracterizan por ter un terraplén na parte eh, exterior e un foso na parte eh, interior, que o que está marcado, se vedes aí, un Avery ou Darrington, eh, Darrington Walls e outros, e o, que está, eh, o foso está marcado en negro. Curiosamente, eh, Stonehenge eh, sigue a, a norma contraria. Eh? Tengo, tengo o foso na parte exterior. Es decir, que Stonehenge, en termos tipolóxicos estritos o morfolóxicos, non é un Henge. <risa> que é unha cosa... Bueno, da ti comenta el, da, unha, esa per, perversa lóxica que ás veces empregamos os, eh, os arqueólogos. Non? E... Stonehenge, na actualidade, está fortemente vin, eh, vinculado á eh, a cuestión druídica. Eh? E isto ten unha, unha orixe na primeira persoa que, fixo, que se dedicou dunha maneira intensiva a estudar este monumento, que foi no século a mediado, no século da Zoite, William Stukeley. Eh? El non tiña outras referencias que non fosen as referencias de, de, de Xulio César cando nas súas campañas en na, na Galia e unha breve incursión que fixo en, na Britania que falaba da existencia dos druidas, etc. Se, eh, eh, Stilkley pensa efectivamente que este é un monumento prehistórico polo tanto prehistórico igual a eh, druídico. E dende entón pois, eh, existe esta, esta vinculación como un do, dos duridas que incluso xera algúns, algúns problemas que teñen que ver coa conservación eh, dos osos eh, recuperados aquí porque como noutros lugares do mundo neses con máis razón eh, se solicita que pues, os, eh, os osos dos antepasados que se sean retornados os os cementerios originais que se sean reenterrados pois tamén aquí toda unha serie de xentes bueno, vinculadas a este neodruidismo eh, presentaron solicitudes ao Ministerio do Interior Británico conforme os restos de, eh, recuperados polos arqueólogos en Stonehenge deberan ser eh, reenterrados só hai un problema e é que estes restos son ás veces máis de 2.500 anos anteriores a calquera existencia de druidas na zona de eh, na zona Stonehenge. Parece que afortunadamente o Ministerio do Interior eh, rexeitou esta, esta solicitude e os osos van continuar eh, no seu sitio natural de conservación que son, eh, que son os distintos museos. E despois, bueno, claro, eh, Stonehenge é un monumento de planta circular. Si, eh, esto permite que se pode encontrar todo tipo de alineacións de tipo, de, de tipo arqueoastronómico, algúnas bastante especulativas, sin embargo, hai algúnas delas que teñen certa base arqueolóxica e no medamente que aparece aí marcada que uh, a relación coa saída do sol, eh, comenzar no eh, solsticio eh, de verán, e outra e outra e unha segunda alineación, digamos, en ángulo recto, como se ve aí na, eh, na diapositiva, que ten que ver co solpor no solsticio eh, no solsticio de inverno. Pero bueno, en todo caso Stonehenge eh, é un monumento tan absolutamente rechamante, é un monumento que en certa medida como un libro aberto que permite todo tipo de lecturas, algunhas delas eh, bastante esotéricas por non decir bastante, bastante loucas, como a que aparecía como a que aparecía aí de os marcianos os, os extraterrestres levando eh, pendurados dos platillos os, os, eh, os esteos de Stonehenge okay. um. So, for a brief uh, chronology of Stonehenge, the first stage was built very shortly after 3000 BC, uh, thanks to a major program of radiocarbon dating. And in that stage, we have found not just the bank and the ditch, but also structures in the entrance and also in the interior. Most of those in the center of the interior are post hulls, and we think that these formed a series of rectangular structures. Uh, but the most interesting feature is a group of 56 pits around the periphery, which are known as the Aubrey hulls. And our research has interpreted these as having held 
standing stones, the first stones uh, of Stonehenge. Now, what is interesting about these is that these are not local to the Stonehenge area. In fact, they have come from over 200 kilometers to the west, from the west of Wales. Uh, they are known as the blue stones. Uh, it is not a geological term, it is merely a, a uh, descriptive term for a variety of different types of rock, many igneous, some uh, sedimentary. And uh, uh, but this now appears to be the first stage of Stonehenge. And it was also from this period that Stonehenge began its use as a cemetery. About four to 500 years later, around 2,500, the second stage of Stonehenge saw the blue stones rearranged into the center and surrounded by the large stones of local sandstone that are known as sarsen. Uh, these probably come from about 30 kilometers to the north in the Avebury area, and as well as forming a circle of dressed uprights with lintels, we also have a horseshoe arrangement in the middle of what are known as trilithons, where we have two uprights, uh, trilithos, uh, with a lintel on the top. And then in the very center, the largest of the blue stones, known uh, as the altar stone. And it is with this phase that burials were continuing, but really uh, they, they die out soon after. Stonehenge sits, of course, within a wider landscape of many monuments. Uh, from the fourth millennium, we have two cursus monuments, and we also have a number of long barrows, Neolithic burial mounds. There are about 15 in the area. And there is also a timber monument at Coneybury, uh, which is from the same date as the first stage of Stonehenge. Uh, I'll also tell you about our discovery of another henge, which has come to be called Bluestone Henge, down by the river. And then the Darrington Walls and Woodhenge complex dates to the second stage of Stonehenge around 2,500. Oops. No margins. <laughs> no more. Um, in, in Stonehenge, se puede distinguir una primera etapa, la que vemos y hay una, una estructura circular formada por un terraplén e interior y una, e un, foso, e un foso principal. Y en su interior se localizaron una serie de, una serie de estructuras que so, consisten en buratos de poste, que están en la parte, en la parte central, que parece que en algún caso eh, conforman estructuras uh, rectangulares. Y luego tenemos los llamados buratos de obri, obri holes, que eh, se disponen en, parale, en paralelo a o, eh, foso eh, do interior. Eh, parece que en realidad estos eh, estes buratos de obri serían las camas de, eh, para eh, unas eh, pedras en festas, que serían las llamadas blue stones, las pedras azules. Son, son unas pedras de distinta origen geológica, en algún caso son plutónicas, en otro son sedimentarias, lo interesante, aparte de su de su cor azulada, es que provenían de gran distancia. Eh? Aproximadamente las canteiras se localizaron a 200 kilómetros de, de distancia. Esta prime, en esta primera etapa, eh, Stonehenge se ha tenido un carácter eh, funerario. Eh? Una etapa que se sitúa en no el prim, no primer tercio do tercer milenio antes de Cristo. En una, segunda, en una segunda etapa, eh, aproximadamente en los séculos centrais eh, de ese mismo tercer milenio, tenemos la datación abajo, eh, se hace una, eh, una transformación importante de las estructuras pétreas interiores de Stonehenge, las eh, Blue Stones, dos círculos de Obri, eh, se arrancan y e parte de las Blue Stones conforman un doble círculo no, eh, no centro. De este, de este monumento, de Stonehenge, y luego se engaden las llamadas sarsen. Estas son, estas son 
eh, son os grandes bloques de pedra arenisca, mm, son máis locais, eh, se eh, extraíron as pedras de, a, a unha distancia menor de Stonehenge, non obstante, eh, as fontes se localizan a 50 km de distancia, o cal importante, tendo en conta o seu gran tamaño, e se, eh, forman eh, estas sarsen, estas eh, grandes pedras de arenisca, forman un círculo adintelado, eh, o máis popular, eh, corresponde coa visión popular deste de monumento, eh, exterior, e eh, logo unha, eh, unha estrutura interna eh, eh, formada por cinco trilitos, na que e eh, eh, que ten unha planta que temos aí no interior e eh, que ten unha planta en eh, ferradura de eh, cabalo que conforma eses trilitos están conformados por dous esteos eh, verticais e eh, que sosteñen un, eh, un dintel e neste momento eh, a ocupación, a utilización funeraria deste de monumento se, uh, se incrementa Ahora ben, eh, Stonehenge non é un monumento, non é un monumento aillado nesta, eh, nesta área, sino que hai toda unha serie de monumentos de características semellantes, como sería o caso do Henge de Coneybury, ou eh, un recentemente descuberto eh, na, na beira do río Avon, que é o Blue, o Blue Stonehenge. Logo temos, eh, si, si ven a, a dereita arriba, Eh, o conxunto formado por Darrington Walls, un hench, e na, na súa inmediación unha estrutura en madeira, que logo falara dela, que é eh, Good Hench. E logo tamén hai eh, do, bueno, todo, todo unha serie de eh, dos chamados Long Mounds, que son túmulos alargados de planta rectangular e túmulos, podíamos decir, estándar, desde o punto de vista polo menos galego, que serían os túmulos redondos, de planta, de planta eh, circular, así como tamén hai eh, dúas estruturas de tipo cursus. Cursus, a traducción, probablemente sería eh, avenida. Eh, vemos aí na parte central de, de, da diapositiva toda esa eh, disposición eh, alongada, rectangular, moi alongada, e eh, sería un dos cursus, e outro que sai, precisamente, Stonehenge, máis, eh, máis estreito. Okay. Uh, in... Uh, recent years, there is a, a, another team uh, called the Stonehenge Hidden Landscape Project, and they have ca carried out a geophysical survey of magnetometry and georadar throughout most of the World Heritage Site. They have uncovered many new monuments, but they are all very small. We think some of these may be much smaller henges than Stonehenge and the others that are known about, but we hope that jointly uh, our Stonehenge Riverside project and the Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes project, that we will work together to investigate in the ground, to ground truth uh, some of these new discoveries to find out what they are. Uh, one discovery was that underneath the bank of Darrington Walls, there might be a row of buried sarsen stones and um, uh, this made the news last September. Uh, we've now had a chance after that news item to actually <coughs> investigate the results in detail. And I'm afraid that I think they probably are not stones. They are part of a circuit that we excavated in 2007 at Darrington Walls, which are holes that were made for large timber posts, but for some reason they never held posts. They were backfilled with different materials, perhaps hard materials like flint, to give this stone-like uh, signature. But we will be digging there in the first two weeks of August as a joint project with the Hidden Landscapes team in order to find out precisely exactly what they are. But I, my guess is that they will not be these exciting stones. Goodbye. <risa> eh, en paralelo con la eh, intervención que eh, dirigida o la serie de intervenciones dirigidas por eh, Mike Parker Pearson, eh, hay un proyecto eh, eh, sobre bueno, hidden landscapes, paisajes agachadas, paisajes eh, escondidas, no que se están utilizando sistemas de teledetección como ma magnetometría o, o, geor, eh, o georadar 
que eh, están, eh, bueno, por una banda están permitiendo tener una idea bastante cabal de eh, la superficie en eh, la eh, comarca, en la área que rodea Stonehenge, pero al mismo tiempo eh, son capaces de penetrar en eh, no subsuelo y eh, de detectar toda, un, todo un mundo de estructuras normalmente de pequeño tamaño que en algún caso podrían ser eh, Henges, monumentos de tipo Henge, pero de dimensiones bastante más eh, cativas que los que hasta ahora eh, se, eh, se conocían, los propiamente monumentales o eh, visibles. Y e luego hubo noticias eh, que se extendieron de hecho por el mundo adiante, por, los, eh, por las redes, sobre la posibilidad de que la magnetometría tuviese detectado en esa zona que estaba en no el mapa, en la parte superior derecha, en eh, de, la zona de Darrington Walls, de una especie de eh, Stonehenge eh, elevado a cubo, eh, no, eh, porque se detectaron unas, eh, unos sinais que parecían indicar la existencia de eh, una serie de grandes buratos alineados, como se puede ver ahí eh, en la parte inferior eh, de la diapositiva, y eh, que o sinal parecía, eh, parecía indicar que eh, tenían eh, piedras chantadas. Y eh, que luego eso fos, eh, fuera, eh, fuera soterrado. Eh, Mike piensa que eh, en realidad eh, efectivamente existen esa, existen esas, esa alineación eh, de, eh, de buratos, pero que no eh, contienen, no están, eh, están sostendo una, un recinto formado por eh, pedras eh, chantadas, sino que probablemente o eco que registra el magnetómetro se eh, obedece al feito de que por alguna razón se hicieron esos, eh, esos buratos y luego fueron enchidos de, eh, de, de material, de derrubos, particularmente eh, con moita pedra, moita pedra de sílex, eh, flint, yo sé flint, eh, sílex, y eso da un, da un eco en los aparatos que, que puede confundir y sugerir la idea de que se trataría de menires que están ahí chantados y soterrados. De todos modos, van a intervir, evidentemente, para comprobar si esta interpretación de la no existencia de ese superhands eh, es correcta o, por lo contrario, sí que hay algo ahí importante de eso. So we know that the, the bank and ditch at Darrington Walls were erected in the middle of the 25th century BC and that they also buried a very extensive settlement, the largest Neolithic settlement that we have yet found anywhere in the British Isles. And that dates to somewhere around 2,500. We think that it is the settlement associated with the construction of the second stage of Stonehenge. Uh, amongst the three timber circles from um, Darrington Walls, we have Woodhenge, the southern circle, and the northern circle. And here is the southern circle built in two stages. Uh, this is a reconstruction done for us by the, TV, the popular archaeology TV program Time Team uh, to give an idea of how it may have looked. Uh, There are many ideas. Did they have a roof? Did this structure have a roof or not? We don't know, but we think probably not. That southern circle had its own avenue that we discovered uh, leading to the river. The southern circle itself looks towards midwinter solstice sunrise, uh, but the avenue is oriented towards it, facing towards midsummer solstice sunset. And as you can see, it, it is a large feature. It uh, has a surface that is 15 meters across. And including the two uh, banks on the outside, it is almost 30 meters uh, across. Uh, as well as the avenue on either side of it, we discovered in uh, 2004 to 2007 that there were areas of midden, uh, so large quantities of rubbish, and many houses. Uh, they're small rectangular houses, uh, square, about five meters by five meters. And here is a plan and some photographs. They are of different forms, that some are clearly domestic 
residences, houses, casa, but there are also annexes and others, two of the houses on the avenue banks were open at one side, so facing towards the river, looking down towards the river, uh, they were open on that side. They're also different because they did not have beds in them, and so we think that these were actually some kind of, um, I don't know, what, uh, place to, to stand and watch to see whatever ceremonies were happening along the avenue. The settlement is unusual because we have such good preservation. Uh, that is the Neolithic ground surface that we had come down onto the top of, perfectly preserved. This is very rare to find this in southern England, uh, but it gave us a very good insight into not just the houses and the way they were lived in, but we also had all the, the rubbish uh, associated with each house. So we have been able to look at the consumption patterns between the different buildings. And from our excavations and from previous excavations, we can now reconstruct some idea of the size of the settlement, that it covered 17 hectares and may have consisted of many hundreds, if not as many as a thousand houses. So we think that this would have been a population of perhaps 4,000 to 5,000 people who were living here, and the radiocarbon date suggests that this was a very short-lived event, uh, less than 45 years. Wow. Quizás <laughs> um, una de las cosas que una de las novedades más interesantes es la descubierta en Darrington Walls, no, no Hench, de Darrington Walls, de uno de los eh, asentamientos más importantes o más importante do neolítico final eh, calcolítico eh, británico. Eh, Darrington, eh, Darrington Walls, eh, como se ve ahí, eh, as, eh, sus datas eh, se mueven en torno a los séculos centrais do, eh, eh, do tercero milenio. Eh, tengo, una serie de, tengo una serie de estructuras feitas en, en madera, en el caso eh, no exterior, de Goodhenge, y luego tengo eh, dos círculos eh, de eh, madera eh, no, no propio interior da, eh, de, esa, de ese Henge. Eh, este sería o eh, Círculo Sur, que fue reconstruido por, una, por un programa eh, dedicado a arqueología en la, tele, en la televisión británica. Y, y no se sabe muy bien si tiña, si tiña, no se sabe, mejor dicho, si esta estructura a base de postes eh, que tiene dos eh, etapas eh, bastante cortas, si tenía una cobertura, eh, un teito o, eh, o no. O que sí se descubrió que este eh, círculo sur, eh, se encuentra en el interior de Hens, de Darrington Walls, eh, tiene eh, una especie de, 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 gran, eh, de gran avenida eh, que, está, eh, rode, que está flanqueada eh, por sendos eh, terraplens, componiendo una estructura bastante visible, más o menos un, unos 30 metros eh, de ancho, eh, que eh, comunica que une ese círculo sur de postes de madera eh, con el río, eh, río Avon. Por lo tanto, muy probablemente algo relacionado con algún tipo de actividad, eh, de actividad ceremonial. Y luego también se, de, eh, se descubrió en este, en este asentamiento que tiene una vida muy corta, a pesar de su gran densidad de habitación, en torno a medio a medio, eh, a medio, século, eh, medio século de vida, eh, se descubrieron eh, las plantas, las, eh, los fondos de, de cabana de diversas, eh, de diversas formas, redondas, rectangulares, y eh, comenta, comenta que algunas de las, eh, algunas das, eh, entre comillas, eh, viviendas eh, eh, documentadas mediante la excavación, en realidad no estaban pechadas, eh, sino que eran como una especie de cobertizos o de alpendres que estaban eh, orientados, digamos, a, a pared eh, orientada a al río Avon, abierta, como si fuesen lugares dispuestos para observación, bajo teito, de ceremoniales 
que tenían lugar en las inmediaciones, en las riberas del eh, río Avon. Es decir, que la que eh, eh, conservación de los restos, incluido todo tipo de basura eh, doméstica, es eh, excelente en este conjunto de Darrington Walls, lo cual permitió eh, estudiar muy bien las distintas digamos, las pautas de vida y, e, por lo tanto, o, o tipo de, eh, de basura xerada, de restos de alimentos, cerámicas, etcétera, etcétera, xerado por cada una de esas, uh, por cada una de esas unidades domésticas. Y en conjunto, Darrington Walls con, eh, configura un, eh, un, uh, un lugar eh, de, eh, de asentamiento de corta duración, como comentaba antes, de en torno a los 50 años, formado por eh, centenares, cuando no... Eh, miles, de, eh, miles de cabanas, tanto dentro del recinto, de Hench, estrictamente hablando, como en eh, no el lado na, na, no exterior, en la parte sur, preto del eh, río Avon, al final de esa, de esa avenida que se ha ido del círculo sur, configurando a fin, a 4000 people, I, I think you said. Eh, posible, posiblemente estaríamos hablando en este periodo de unas 4000 personas viviendo aquí. We have been able to analyze the hundreds of thousands of animal bones, and 90% uh, of those are of pigs. And we have found that from the strontium isotope analysis of their tooth enamel, that many have come from perhaps hundreds of miles away from different parts of Britain. And there they have been killed in large numbers in the autumn and winter months at Stonehenge uh, for feasting. And we have found two types of, uh, of, of cuisine. So there is uh, cerdo a la brasa. <laughs> barbacoa. <laughs> barbacoa. 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 And, and uh, carne o caldero. Uh, so <laughs> boiling in, in large pots. Um, and uh, we have also <coughs> been studying the cattle. So although they only constitute 10% of the assemblage, We still have very large numbers, and the strontium isotopes show that they come from a variety of different geologies, so that we have uh, some of them within the blue lines coming from the chalklands, and of course Stonehenge is here, so these may all be local. These and these are not local, but again, they need not have come from more distance than 30 to 50 kilometers. But it is these, and particularly these, that have come from many miles away. And it is this group which come from the very old volcanic rocks that we find really only in Scotland in Britain. So this is interesting because uh, we think that uh, there is no contact across the channel with Brittany, which has similar rocks. So we think that actually these animals are probably coming from the, uh, down the entire length of Britain. And this tells us something very important, which is that this is not simply about building a monument as efficiently as possible with, uh, with uh, food coming from as close by, but this is a project that involved people from across the entire island of Britain. Because this is a place of the living, our only human remains consist of three bones and one tooth. And the human tooth comes from, oops, comes from these areas. So the most likely nearest location is either Wales, the place of the blue stones, or the southwest. Ben, eh, me parece que aquí no voy a tener mucho trabajo para traducir. Eh, en Darrington, en Darrington Wall se, se encontró un gran número de restos de eh, animales domésticos, en particular de dos tipos, de porco por, un, por una banda y e, eh, gando eh, vacuno por la otra. Los eh, porcos, eh, en algunos casos, venían de, de, de zonas bastante eh, lonxanas, e o estudo de o estudo dos osos en particular da da región eh, da región maxilar dos porcos e, e, 
as pautas de crecemento que amosan indica que foron sacrificados para festins que tiñan lugar na segunda metade do ano, no outono e inverno. A maneira de preparalos é bastante conhecida para nós como fundamentalmente ou ben en barbacoa, o cerdo porco a brasa, ou ben fervido en grandes olas, sería un, polo tanto, perfectamente traducido xa como unha carne o caldeiro. É moi revelador a análise isotópica dos osos dos bovinos atopados en Darrington Wells. Hai algúns deles, unha parte deles, que moi ben poidan non ser locais, porque a súa marca isotópica apunta a que proviñan desas zonas azuis, que son as zonas de Chocland, son as zonas calizas de Creta, que van de Yorkshire ata o suroeste de Inglaterra. Pero, claro, hai outras hai outras marcas isotópicas de segando que apuntan a localizacións máis distantes, non moi distantes, quizáis 30-40 kilómetros, no país de Gales, na parte leste de Cornualles. E, por último, isto quizáis é o máis interesante, temos unha serie de osos de gando que proveñen de áreas lonxanas, concretamente, de Escocia. Isto nos fala de que construir Stonehenge, vivir na planicie de Stonehenge, non era si máis un proxecto máis ou menos eficiente, eficaz de construir un monumento da maneira máis rápida, máis produtiva posible, senón que estamos diante dun proxecto que atañe ou que involucra a comunidades públicas que, en último caso, abarcan a totalidade do territorio actual británico. Dado que Darrington Walls é un espazo para os vivos, prácticamente non hai restos humanos, hai un par de fragmentos que comentou, e falou tamén dun diente. De novo, aquí, os estudos de tipo isotópico apuntan a esas tres posibilidades. Ven Escocia, ven o país de Gales, ven a parte leste de Cornualles. Moi probable verosímilmente, mellor dito, verosímilmente isto pode corresponder á zona de onde viñan as pedras azuis, que viñan desa zona de Gales. So, as for human remains, we've been able to re-excavate at Stonehenge because in the 1920s about half of Stonehenge was excavated and at that time there was no scientific interest in cremated human remains. So they were all reinterred in 1935 in one of the Aubrey holes. We re-excavated those in 2008, and uh, unfortunately they had all been mixed together into one great heap, 45 kilos of human remains, and we have had a very patient osteoarchaeologist who has been through every single one. And she has now completed our report, which is about to be published in the next issue of Antiquity. <coughs> uh, what we have discovered is that we now have 63 cremation deposits from Stonehenge. And we estimate that that is uh, probably less than half. There, there may have been over 200 people buried at Stonehenge uh, during stages one and two. And this makes it the largest cemetery in the whole of Britain in the third millennium BC. Uh, we have analyzed, or my, my, my hardworking osteologist has analyzed the remains, and she has discovered that there are equal numbers of women and men, but very few sub-adults, so very few children or infants. Uh, there is also a, a, as yet unpublished um, isotopic analysis carried out by Rick Schulting and his student Christoph Snurk at Oxford University. And what they have discovered is that a proportion of the people buried at Stonehenge are not only not local to the region, but they lived probably 
in Western Britain, so most likely in the area of Wales, the same region as the source of the blue stones. Bem, nos anos 30, aproximadamente a metade de, de Stonehenge foi, eh, foi escavada. E nesse momento, se, atoparon, se atopou um grande número de restos óseos incinerados. Daquela não se lhes deu demasiada importância e todos, eh, e todos esses restos de incinerações foram botados a um dos buratos que comentava antes, de o Sobri eh, Hall. Eh, Compunha uma amostra... Eh, neste, neste burato de nada menos que 45 quilos de osos pertencentes a, a, a um total de 63 enterramentos de incineração. Comenta Mike que um uh, paleoantropólogo extraordinariamente paciente que forma parte do seu equipo eh, se foi, eh, foi estudando um por um cada um desses, eh, cada um desses fragmentos osos chegando à conclusão de que eh, probablemente se trata de dos restos de uns 240 individuos que foram eh, enterrados, que foram incinerados e ao longo de 600 anos na eh, no está, no, na etapa 1 e 2 de eh, deste monumento de Stonehenge. Ele o, o, o configura como o cementerio mais eh, mais grande de de Gran-Bretaña no terceiro milenio antes de Cristo. E como aparece aí comentado, e, o, se trata, parece que há uma proporção e, parella de homens e de mulheres, isso sim, sí, adultos. Há muito poucos individuos e, infantis ou adolescentes. E, de novo, igual que se fixo co Gando, se examinou a marca isotópica, en concreto a partir do estudo dos isótopos de estroncio, como comenta aí, e parece que uma parte importante do, eh, desses individuos eh, eh, proviñan ou viviron na eh, parte occidental de Gran-Bretaña. Moi probablemente eh, nese mesmo punto onde eh, sinalaban xa alguns eh, restos de Gando e eh, posiblemente ese dente en Darrington Wells, que seria o país de Gales, onde están as canteiras que proporcionaram parte do material de construcción de Stonehenge. Uh, I mentioned that we had also discovered a new henge by the river at the end of the Stonehenge Avenue, and this has come to be called Blue Stonehenge, because within the bank, uh, within the ditch and bank of a small henge, we discovered an earlier circular structure uh, a series of intercutting pits, and we could tell from the uh, from the the, uh, the voids within them, and from the uh, dimensions of the pits, that these had once held small upright stones. And because the chalk was soft here, we could even discover that we had impressions of the stones that had actually once stood in these holes before they were removed. And the date of removal uh, is around 2,400, uh, at the same point at which we have a new circle of these blue stones installed within Stonehenge. We don't have any date for the actual construction of this small stone circle by the river, but the typology of the arrowheads suggests that this may well have been around 3,000 BC, the same time as the Aubrey Holes. Eh, preto, de, preto do río Avon, eh, como se comentou antes, eh, descubriron no curso destas, eh, destes últimos proxectos un novo, os restos de un novo eh, henge, eh, o que denominaron Blue, Blue Stone Henge. Eh, denominaron así porque eh, descubriron que eh, eh, soterrado eh, existía Unha, toda unha serie de, eh, de buratos que, con toda seguridad, por as marcas que quedan no fondo, eh, este sí eh, se trataría de camas para, eh, eh, soporta que soportaban, nos que estaban chantadas, eh, chantados, unha, eh, unha serie de menires eh, que eh, parece tratarse de, por, los, por algún fragmento de bluestones, es decir, as mesmas eh, as mesmas bluestones que foram empregadas na eh, primeira eh, e logo despois eh, 
reconstruídas, de otra manera, en la segunda etapa de Stonehenge. Eh, a destrucción o a remoción de este Blue Stonehenge eh, tiene lugar eh, precisamente en, en datas coincidentes con los inicios de esa segunda etapa que veíamos de reconstrucción de, en eh, Stonehenge. No se sabe eh, o momento preciso en no que uh, fue eh, construido este, este Henge, pero se piensa por la tipología de las puntas de seta que fueron, eh, que fueron atopadas aquí en este yacimiento, que muy probablemente sería coetáneo con la fase eh, inicial eh, de, eh, de Stonehenge, cuando se fan los Aubrey Holes en Stonehenge, por lo tanto estaríamos hablando dos inicios del tercer milenio antes de Cristo. Uh, we also discovered that along the avenue that is aligned on the solstice at Stonehenge, we had beneath it an earlier feature which was also aligned towards the midsummer sunrise, midwinter sunset. But to our surprise, we discovered that this was actually a natural feature, a feature of two natural ridges, one here, one there, and a series of, uh, of fissures of periglacial stripes. So these are all features formed in, the, in a previous ice age, and by sheer coincidence, they happened to be aligned on that solstice axis. So we think that this may have been something that was recognized by the Neolithic builders of Stonehenge who located their enclosure at the very end of this 150 meter natural phenomenon. And then later they cut the ditches for the avenue in order to accentuate the banks, the natural banks of this natural monument. So we think that they have incorporated the natural landscape into their monument. Um, we also think that possibly this is something that may have been recognized long before the Neolithic people by people thousands of years earlier in the Mesolithic. Es muy, eh, es muy interesante que esa, esa avenida que se ve eh, eh, arranca eh, eh, desde Stonehenge, eh, esta, eh, esa alineación marcada por ese, por ese menhir eh, que aparece ahí eh, hallado, eh, está eh, eh, representada también de una, forma, de una forma natural por la existencia de una, eh, de una, pequeña, promine, eh, de una pequeña prominencia eh, no, eh, de sustrato rochoso que tiene eh, toda una serie de eh, fisuras que se pueden ver en la parte inferior da eh, da diapositiva y e que conf, eh, que se eh, adecúan a esa eh, a ese alineamiento astronómico con sol por no eh, no solsticio de eh, de invierno eh, de feito ellos eh, son conscientes de esa eh, da existencia de esa alineación por así decirlo eh, natural geológica y e cuando y eh, eh, cuando ellos fan los eh, fosos y eh, los eh, terraplén que conforman los eh, laterales de ese curso, de esa avenida que arranca de Stonehenge, lo eh, fan precisamente para eh, los lados de esa, de esa formación geológica para enfatizar aún más esa, eh, esa, esa característica puramente natural. Es decir, que probablemente los constructores de Stonehenge están incorporando un elemento puramente natural en eh, una eh, estructura eh, artificial. Probablemente, además, esta, esta observación se remonta a, tal vez a miles de años atrás, antes de la construcción de Stonehenge. Es decir, que formaba parte ya del conocimiento de poblaciones incluso ni, ni siquiera agricultoras de los últimos cazadores-recolectores en la zona. And the early Mesolithic activity at Stonehenge uh, consists not only of, we have charcoal from the center of Stonehenge of around uh, 7,500 BC, but we also have in close proximity underneath where the old car park used to be for the visitor center, we had a line of holes for large posts of pine. So these post holes 
uh, up to 10,000 years old from the early Mesolithic. And within Britain, these are unique. These are our only uh, monumental Mesolithic structure. And even within Northern Europe, to find a monument like this associated with early hunter-gatherers, uh, hunter-gatherers in the early Holocene <coughs> period is very unusual. Uh, whilst those are located just here, excavations down by the river to the north of Bluestone Henge have identified a major occupation area uh, with radiocarbon dates from the same time as the posts and the charcoal at Stonehenge all the way through to the very end of the Mesolithic, just before the beginning of the Neolithic. And uh, we have many uh, silex artifacts. Uh, this is work that's been carried out by a different group, but it gives a new dimension to the significance of the Stonehenge area long before the beginning of farming. We have been also, oh, did I, is I that, think, oh, I there was, I did, on. didn't I, you're right. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Start. 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 <laughs> Eh, abundando lo que lo que comentaba lo que comentaba antes a paisaje de eh, a paisaje de, Stone, eh, de Stonehenge eh, ya fuera eh, ya fuera ocupada y eh, eh, tal eh, tal vez dotada de, de significación no no periodo anterior a agricultura hay algunas evidencias no pro, eh, algunos carbones datados no, no propio interior del monumento de Stonehenge que nos llevan a aproximadamente a unos 7000 años y e, en las inmediaciones de, de Stonehenge se descubrió una serie de buratos que tenían albergado un grandes tron, un alineamiento o que conformaría un alineamiento formado por grandes eh, troncos de piñeiro que cuya eh, cuya datación se movería pues entre octavo milenio e, o e, séptimo milenio antes de Cristo hay que mencionar que son muy raros este es muy rara este tipo de evidencia monumental eh, para o, para un periodo mesolítico y e, por otra banda no en la parte nor, eh, nordeste o nordeste do Blue Stonehenge se otro eh, otro equipo eh, localizó en Blickmead Mead, Blick Mead eh, una toda una serie de eh, artefactos de concentraciones de artefactos de estructuras eh, livianas que eh, de nuevo nos eh, nos sitúan en, en un periodo que va entre los mediados de octavo milenio y e último eh, casi último tercio del quinto milenio, es decir, casi en los momentos inmediatamente anteriores a introducción de eh, a introducción de agricultura en eh, la zona. Es decir que no era esta, en resumiendo, no era esta una zona baleira antes de la llegada de la economía productora y e de los inicios de la construcción de los monumentos más antiguos. Now we've been investigating most recently the sources of the stones. As I said, we know that most of the sarsens come from just 30 kilometers away, but we have spent more time looking at the sources for the bluestones. Oops, wrong one. And it is in this area that our geologists have pinpointed three precise locations of existing outcrops. Uh, one of these is here at Khan Goidog on the north side of the Priscelli Mountains, and the other is to the north of that in a small valley uh, known as Craig Rosavellin. This is uh, of the type of rock uh, rhyolite, and we know that one stone from Stonehenge came from this outcrop, and most particularly, we can actually pinpoint it geologically to this location right here. We are very lucky with the, the nature of the rock, that it, it differs all the way around the outcrop. And we actually have the void left by the removal of one pillar. And that is where it is. We have activity from other periods, uh, including the uh, Mesolithic here, but closest to this particular location, we have a small occupation area uh, with a fireplace uh, producing radiocarbon dates 
uh, from the time just before Stonehenge. Uh, we also have direct evidence of megalith extraction. Uh, this one here, propped, ready to go, but this dates to a later phase of quarrying because the artificial platform of soil underneath the, the props for this stone uh, contains material of the early Bronze Age from around 2000 BC. So we know that this outcrop was visited twice, once in the Neolithic and once in the Bronze Age to extract megaliths. Ben, una das, eh, una das líneas de investigación ten que ver coa orixe da, das pedras utilizadas en eh, Stonehenge e moi en particular coas pedras azules, que xa dende hai anos xa se eh, situara esa, esa fonte de orixe nas, mo, eh, nas montañas de Presley, eh, en no país eh, de Gales. En concreto, os eh, xeólogos eh, sinalaron dous puntos, dúas eh, canteiras, xa Carn Gudog e Craig Rosifelin, um, que temos aí, Ken Gordog. En... E aquí teríamos unha desas fontes. E tiveron a fortuna de que as análises petrográficas puderon sinalar con claridade que eh, unha, un fragmento, un, un, un esteo de riolita eh, que eh, se encontra en Stonehenge proviña precisamente da, eh, dese punto onde está eh, dese afloramento onde está apoiado onde está apoiado Mike eh, precisamente e de feito o oco o oco coincide exactamente coa eh, coa pedra que se localiza en Stonehenge hai algunhas evidencias de actividade mesolítica eh, nas inmediacións desta desta canteira pero xusto na eh, a OP eh, a carón Da, do punto onde se extraiu ese, ese, ese chanto se encontraron indicios de actividade de carbóns que puderon datarse eh, no neolítico e xusto no, no momento previo a eh, construcción da primeira fase de, eh, de Stonehenge e, pero sin embargo esta, esta canteira en Craig Rosifelin eh, tamén foi eh, objeto de extraccións en períodos posteriores Sábese a partir dos materiais atopados eh, baixo ese, ese esteo que isto tivo lugar na idade do bronce. Por tanto, teríamos dúas fases de canteiría aquí, unha neolítica e outra xa na idade do bronce. The other, the other site we've investigated is Can Goidog and it is here that well, there has been some recent 19th century quarrying but to the side of it, unaffected, are the remains of the prehistoric quarry. This is spotted dolerite, uh, a very distinctive rock, and the majority of the bluestones at Stonehenge are made of this rock and probably come from this particular quarry. What we have discovered here is actually pillars broken from the rock, ready to be transported. So I have my hand on one, and there's another one here, another one here, and another one here, but also many gaps where pillars have already been removed. And they have come from here, and at the foot of that, we have the remains of a large artificial platform, uh, the sediments associated dating to just before the construction of Stonehenge. And outside of that, we have a stone-filled ditch, and then beyond that, an earth ramp. So our artificial platform, you can see, uh, we have uh, 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 quite extensive and then there are two features beyond it set into the top of the filled in ditch and they may well be trestles uh, uprights to support monoliths laid on top of them. Okay. Eh, a canteira de donde proveñen a maior parte das, eh, das pedras azu, eh, azuis é en Can Goedoc. E, en diquetivo, alguna actividade extrativa no século XIX non afectou demasiado as, eh, a canteiría eh, neolítica. Aquí se, se atopa un, un tipo de rocha que é unha dolerita con, con manchas, spot, eh, spot dolerite, eh, que eh, compón a, maior, a maioría eh, das, eh, das blue stones eh, localizadas en, eh, en Stonehenge. As escavacións e mesmo a prospección 
indica que eh, hay, como en este caso, donde Mike se está apoyando, en una eh, lache que sea fuera eh, separada, fuera arrancada, pero que no llegó a transportarse y se ven los socos de eh, lashes que fueron retiradas y eh, elevadas en no sé, un momento a Stonehenge. Y e, además, eh, indicativas de la eh, intensidad de las actividades extractivas desenvolvidas aquí, se encontró una plataforma artificial cuyos sedimentos eh, subyacentes, que estaban por debajo de la plataforma, nos indica una datación eh, inmediatamente anterior a la primera fase constructiva de Stonehenge. Hay, luego hay a izquierda, hay un, un foso que está enchido eh, de pedras y eh, e una rampa eh, a izquierda, es decir, todo esto probablemente vinculado a los trabajos de eh, transformación mínima y e transporte de estas, eh, de estas lases. Y e, lo que tenemos aquí, precisamente, quizá relacionado con una primera modificación de esas lases una vez extraídas de la canteira, esa especie de, eh, de chantos que están deitados para apoyar eh, como caballetes y e los eh, eh, esteos que luego después de una primera transformación serían levados. And between the two sources of Khan Goidog <coughs> and Craig Rosavellin, we have recently, in the last few months, discovered uh, what appears to be a Neolithic tomb, uh, 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 possibly a passage grave. Uh, this is the uh, geophysics, this is resistivity, and it shows what we think is a cruciform chamber and the remnants of a corridor, a passage, and then there is a circle of stone-filled pits uh, here and up here. Now, we know that from the size of the mound that all the upright stones have gone. So it was dismantled at some point in the past. The question is when. Uh, my suspicion is that this is something that actually happened before Stonehenge, that this is the monument that was uh, taken down and moved, so that the stones did not come straight from the quarries to Stonehenge, they came from this passage grave monument. One final point of interest is that the orientation of this passage <coughs> appears to be towards midwinter solstice sunrise, so it may be that this is why this association with the solstice was so important. So just to finish off, what we think we are now looking at with Stonehenge is that as Ramilson suggested so long ago that it might be a monument to the ancestors, but also because of the distances involved of people from Scotland and Wales, that it might be a, a, a monument of unification. And of course that unity uh, from a, a nation, an island divided between two different Neolithics. A Western Neolithic with its ancestry in Brittany and ultimately in Iberia, and an Eastern Neolithic with its ancestry in Northern France and the linear band Keramic. And then with the importance of the solstice, the natural feature at Stonehenge, we think it may have acted as an axis mundi, uh, linking people and cosmos and then also located in a position between these two territorial zones of east and west in what may have been a neutral zone where people could gather from different directions. Okay. Um, en, entre las dos canteras de Can Guedoc, eh, Craig Rosifelling, eh, se localizó una posible sepultura de corredor a partir de la prospección geofísica, en concreto por estudios de resistividad, eh, que sugieren la existencia de una sepultura eh, de corredor de planta, de planta cruciforme eh, eh, rodeada por una, eh, por una estructura eh, circular compuesta de eh, buratos que ahora están eh, recheos de pedras, por los ecos, digamos, da, por los resultados proporcionados por la, eh, por la análisis de resistividad, eh, pero que mm, se piensa que con toda probabilidad eh, inicial, eh, inicialmente terían, eh, terían, eh, cada uno eh, cada un de esos buratos serviría como apoyo, como cama de otros tantos eh, menires, de otras tantas eh, pedras, eh, pedras fitas. 
De novo, ademais, é interesante que o corredor tenha a mesma orientación cara ao solsticio cara ao solsticio invernal de forma que eles se plantean non escavaron ainda aquí neste sitio pero se plantean a posibilidade de que este monumento se desmantela inmediatamente antes de iniciar a construcción de Stonehenge e que parte, polo menos, ou todo ese material e todas esas pedrafitas que rodeaban o sepulcro de corredor que irían, en último caso, a parar xunto con as das canteiras irían parar a construcción dese gran monumento de Stonehenge e logo xa para finalizar en termos de conclusións recollendo a suxerencia de Ra... With the suggestion of Ramisolina, efectivamente, Stonehenge sería un monumento para o consagrado aos antepasados, pero sería bastante máis que iso. Plantea esa posibilidade a partir do conxunto de evidencias recollidas que estaríamos diante de talvez dun monumento que glosara a unificación de dúas líneas de neolitización diferentes, unha afectando a parte occidental, Cornualles, País de Gales, de Gran Bretaña, e outra línea, bueno, unha línea de neolítico que arranca dende a Bretaña dende a Bretaña francesa en último caso de estirpe ibérica e pola outra banda teríamos esa estirpe oriental que en último caso se vincula ás cerámicas ao neolítico continental ás cerámicas de bandas, etc. Nun momento dado se produciría esa unificación deses dous neolíticos desas dúas estirpes. Logo tamén a insistencia nesas alineacións co solsticio de inverno, co solsticio de verán, posiblemente tamén teña que ver con ese concepto de axis mundi, de eixo do mundo, que unifica as actividades humanas, as persoas os seres vivos co cosmos no seu senso máis amplo. E logo tamén, como acontece moitas veces con esas zonas liminares, con esas zonas de fronteira, fronterizas, tal vez a zona de Stonehenge tivese un papel primordial como un área neutral entre eses dous grandes territorios que agora presuntamente tendían a unificarse con esas orixes diferentes, bretona por unha banda e nos países baixos e no mundo neolítico continental e pola outra. And we hope to be excavating the suspected passage tomb in September but until then thank you for listening and of course this has been a big project with many people who have worked so hard I am just the mouthpiece, but remember that you are thanking all of these people for their hard work. Thank you. Well, supongo que no es preciso que traduza, pero simplemente quiere Mike dar las gracias a todos ustedes. E tamén, bueno, que este é un labor de equipo, dun equipo enorme, que sin él non sería posible abordar este traballo.